<laughs> All right, here we go. It's Q and A time, day two. We got people on Facebook Live. Test it one more time. You good? Hello. Hello. All right, we got Facebook Live right here in front of us. Go ahead and pan around the room. 2018, day two. Make some noise, folks. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Leanna Carr, Jason Theobald, Brian Norris, and Cliff Wilson. I'm going to walk around, so if you have a question, raise your hand and try and get a hold of me ahead of time. While someone's asking a question, raise your hand, that way I can get right to you. So, who's got the first question? This side. Right. Right here, right here. Listen, I'm fat, so if I'm over here, I need to see some hands over here. This uh, question is for Cliff, and I know you might not even want to answer this if you can, but I know John kind of put you on the spot yesterday. Um, can you give us a little heads up on this contest prep book you're coming out with? Uh, yeah, John definitely wasn't supposed to mention that. Um, so I've actually been working, uh, for those of you that know, with Dr. Pete Fitchin. Um, we've been working on it for about a year and a half. Um, we're kind of at the mercy we're working with a publisher at the moment. And so, um, you know, they we've been having to go through... Uh, they, they tend to publish a lot of textbooks as well, so we've had to go through a pretty extensive peer review process as well, and editing process. So, um, you know, it's just going to be the combination of what the research says, what our experience has shown. Um, it looks like it'll be at some point next year, maybe early in the year. Um, but it's pretty extensive. I can even say for myself, like, I wrote the peaking chapter alone, it was like almost 40 pages. And I cover a lot of different peaking styles and things like that. So I think people will be happy. Um, it's it's a lot of new things that I think a lot of people haven't read before. And um, so it should be early next year. I can't say exactly when. I don't really know. But uh, I promise I will post about it a lot. You guys will be sick of it by the time <laughs> by the time it comes around. So I'll let you guys know. Uh, so this question is for pretty much any of you guys out there. I've followed everyone up there for about four or five years now. Uh, yesterday, uh, one of the speakers said that BCAs is just flavored water. Um, but I know almost every one of you guys up there use BCAs. So what's your take on it? And um, I also know like Cliff Stacks EAs with BCAs. Can you go a little more in depth on that, please? So um, yeah, I have started using, because the newer research is showing that uh, essential amino acids are superior to branched amino acids alone. So I have uh, gotten in the habit of saying, you know, I because I do think some essential amino acid products are a little bit low in leucine content to maybe maximally spike protein synthesis. So a lot of times I'll take like a you know a five to ten gram dose of branched amino acids with the full spectrum of essential amino acids. So I kind of use them kind of combined together. Um, because the newer research is showing that it's just it's just better. Um, I don't like to use whey protein during, and I use this during a workout, I should say. I don't like to use whey protein during a workout because I feel like then you start splitting blood flow between digestion and uh, the working muscle. So, you know, you, if you do free form amino acids, then you're going to get kind of the best of both worlds, at least in my opinion there. I agree, I agree with Cliff, so I don't know that I could add anything extra on it. I will, I will say uh, I agree as well. Uh, I was sponsored by Salvation to make a branch chain amino acids that has like the product. Um, but also like just part of life is that you follow the current literature, right? So science takes time to replicate studies and we find new answers. So I would say that as long as you're on the side of evidence, as Cliff said in his talk, there will be times where you're still taking the meter forward, albeit you may do some things wrong, right? So in hindsight, uh, were we wrong about branch chains? Yeah, probably the same way they were wrong about Super Gainer back in the 80s, with, right? That's, that's, what the, that's what they knew at the time. So um, I think that's part of this process. Like, you'll be wrong, you'll waste money. I would argue that it's a, a little better than flavored water. Right? There's some benefit. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a dominant factor like creatine or whey protein. Um, but I think I would take it if the price point justified it's uh, correlated to its benefit. And I think as of now, that's why there's such an anti-push against it, just because the price to um, price to benefit ratio. That's true. Yeah, and I guess I would just agree with what everybody else said. Um, at the time when I first started lifting, I would take BCAAs um, in every single drink. I had it in my jug because salvation was cool at the time, and I had no idea why I was taking it. Um, I think now, as, I mean, for the most part, all of us are 
bodybuilders in here, so we have a, a sufficient amount of protein intake that we have. There's not really a need for it. Um, I guess the only way I would see, and I, I'm not really well versed on this, is maybe if you're a vegan bodybuilder or you have a more plant-based diet, I would see, and you might be able to talk more on that, but that's what I would say. Uh, I guess everything else has been mentioned, but maybe certain folks with um, uh, certain GI tract issues, like, you know, maybe you can't have your protein exactly where you would like and to kind of fortify whatever amounts you are having. Um, I think uh, essential amino acids is probably what I'd go with, but uh, that's other, another practical use. Um, but every once in a while, I think, if you just kind of know how things work, like these are drills, situations come up and you're like, okay, like that's what supplements are for. So, so yeah, no, but I agree with these guys. So kind of to go alongside the EAA and BCAA talk, uh, how do you guys feel about carbohydrates during training? I was watching uh, a core nutritional athlete talk about, what, let's say, um, highly cyclic dextrin clusters pulling blood into the gut versus keeping it in the muscle. Do you guys think that would have a negative impact on her, uh, anything? I mean, I've heard John talk about it as a recovery agent, so. Just kind of like to get opinions on that. Uh, so um, I I was supposed to be a registered dietitian. I dropped out at some point because it was like 3D muscle journey or stay here. And like everyone who I remember just talking to everyone what they wanted to do. It's like it's like fuck. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm like what am I doing here? Um, but uh, one of uh, I, I think I didn't get to clinicals, but uh, the whole digestive process and really like learning about that part has been beneficial to, to what I do. Um, and for example, like fructose versus like dextrose, like we're talking about like 10 minutes. That's the difference, especially if, if you're in a position where you need it. Um, I think in regards to how much you need, 15 grams of carbohydrate typically is like enough to get your blood glucose levels to like what is stable and like what you need so that you can go from, especially prepping, I feel like zombie to like, uh, or, or sometimes like for those like burners or people who do go through substrate like relatively uh, efficiently. So someone like a, like a Cliff or myself, um, even in the off season, sometimes it's like, hey, it like lets me get through that like second leg of my workout like with uh, more consistency. Um, so I do think they're beneficial. I just, I don't think you should be, this is just me, um, too picky with what you use. But then again, like I haven't, I haven't looked into what you mentioned and, and or, or played around with it, like in practice with my athletes. Um, but yeah, I do think they work. And for some people, even in the off season, they're, they're, they're great to have around the whole time, especially the longer you do this, the more volume you need to progress. Uh, the, okay, Cliff, how many sets of, of work do you do, you do for most body parts? Like 60 sets a week, right? Something like that. Yeah, so like, a guy like him who's a burner, like who's been going at it, and like, guess what, 10 years from now he's gonna need even more volume to keep going? Like, you probably should have a little something into training. Um, so yeah, that was actually kind of where I was gonna go with it. If your intensity isn't there in your training, don't mess with them. But, um, if your intensity is there, for the last two years, uh, since I got my card, I've been really kind of a big proponent of putting them in, at least for myself. And then um, I've tried a lot of them. So I've tried the cyclic dextrins, I've tried, tried carbolin, and I've tried Vitario, I've tried Gatorade. And I'll tell you, my two favorite are carbolin and Gatorade. So I would piggyback on what Berto was saying and check what your digestion is doing. So, if you feel like there's blood going in your stomach and you're bloated and things, and it's not, you don't process it maybe the way the science or the, the label says, so test it, but I stick with the ones that I feel best using. So a lot of times there's a convenience store right by my house, I'll just stop and get a, a G2, it's got about 40 grams of carbs, and I'll, I'll drink that, and then you know throw in my AAs and different things with it. So I do love it, the intensity has to be there. If someone's higher in body fat, I'm definitely not gonna keep it in during prep, um, but if someone starts out leaner, um, I'm 12 weeks out, I feel like I'm pretty far ahead of the game, I'm gonna keep it in, but I did drop them back to just 20 grams. I was doing 50. I really don't think that people need more than 50 to 60. Um, 
intra uh, to get the job done, what you're trying to do with you know the glycogen, the muscle pumps, to recover faster after workout. That's my take. A big super heavyweight, maybe 285 pound guy, uh, 100, 100 grams, but you know the most of us are gonna be anywhere from 40 to 60. Um, and a lot of times with women in the off season who need to put on muscle, I use that as well and I'll get them in. Maybe I'll start around 30 to 25. Um, and go from there. But I'm big at nutrient timing. I think your biggest meal should be pre, uh, post, with uh, with with the with the diet with the, um, carbs intro. So I really do believe in it and thinks it helps. But when you diet, it, it depends. It's, it's a dependent situation for me as a coach, anyways. So uh, I I agree with both these guys. I don't think you sometimes need a whole lot to get the job done. Like when you're in prep, like you know, 15 to 25 grams is usually what I'll fall between. As far as the source, I actually agree with what Jason's saying, where he's like, um, individuality matters. I'm always really intrigued by individuality um, because, like, have you guys ever had a pre-workout that you loved and you're like, oh, I feel this so much, and you give it to your friend, and he's like, I didn't really do much for me. Um, and I think that. I do think you need to try different sources and see what feels good to you because you can notice the difference and um, It's not going to be the same for everybody So I think that the source you can try different sources and then the last thing I kind of want to add to it is like some people I was, If she's watching I'm not gonna name her but like one of my clients was like how much of a difference will this really make? And I'm like well not much um, Because like that's one of the things that people say is like I and I encourage my clients to have a protein shake after their workout, they're like, can't I go home and eat? And I'm like, well, eating takes a little longer to digest, and you gotta go home and get it, whereas whey protein's like, to your bloodstream quickly, and I'm like, how much difference is that gonna make? Here's the thing is, besides training and eating the appropriate macros, nothing is gonna make that big of a difference. Like, if you can do, if I can do 10 things that make a 1% difference, you're 10% better. So, I mean, if you're serious about this, I'm like, do every little thing. You may want to eat those 15 extra carbs, but too bad. If you want that 1% difference, you do, you know, take it during your training. So I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of doing little things. I fight you on that. Yo, yeah. So uh, I wasn't going to say anything, but <laughs> yesterday Brad kept saying uh, this phrase, and he said, you're missing the forest for the trees, right? I think what is, have, why I've sustained over the years and why a lot of people on this panel have sustained over the years is because Dominant factors is everything, right? Like, are you doing consistently pre, post workout sleep? Are you getting the dominant factors done, right? And I think sometimes people scramble for something that makes half a percent of a difference just as an excuse or a new distraction when you're just not mastering these basic dominant factors. Do you take, do you take creatine every day, consistently for years? Like, are you doing the basic things? Fuck the brand chains. Like, I'm not saying you don't need them. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. They're good, right? But before you look outward, make sure your dominant factors of the things that give you 30% return are good before fructose versus dextrose. Yeah, versus I agree on that. Yeah, so. Um, so I think we can all agree that bodybuilders are pretty badass, tough, intense people. Like my prep coach is Cliff, and his motto is intensity is everything. Um, and I think that this kind of goes into the um, Leanna's talk. Um, so I guess at what point do you have to step back and realize that this sport isn't for you? Um, like for her, me personally, I just got off my first show um, and I fell off the rails really, really, really hard. So it's laughing right now. <laughs> but like, I guess at what point do you have to realize that you're just being too hard on yourself or if this is actually just something that you should be doing? Um, I think that all of us can agree that our first show afterwards, we all fell off the rails. I mean, I can even say, you know, I've done two competitive seasons. My last season um, was when I went for my pro card. But after my first one, um, I had to end my season early because after that one taste of a cheat meal that I had, right, um, I just continued to binge and I just went crazy and I just gained a lot of weight. Um, I think that that's kind of goes towards like the experience thing. Like the longer you do this, the longer that you live the bodybuilding lifestyle, the better habits that you'll be able to maintain in your off season that make the contest prep not as different from your off season. So I think that that's one thing is just realizing like you have to try this a couple times just because you had one bad prep experience doesn't mean that you're not cut out to be a good bodybuilder. Um, I think all of us, you know, we all are first preps like we, none of us looked the way that we wanted to I dieted down after only like two years of training and realized that I had no muscle at all 
Um, and I think it's just really being honest with yourself, realizing, like I said, like it's not something you did wrong, but we always have room to improve. Um, as humans, as athletes, we always have room to get better. So I think just acknowledging that, um, not being too hard on yourself if you know you did mess up your reverse diet, and that's something that I want to talk about at some point. So if somebody please ask me that question. Um, but just you know, not being so hard on yourself and remembering that this whole thing that you're doing, like you have to look at it from an athlete perspective. Like this hobby is not a definition of who you are. Just because you mess up a prep doesn't mean you're like not a like good human being. It doesn't mean that you don't have high motivation for other aspects of your life. But look at it like an athlete. Like I'm not, you know, like during a contest prep, like the goal is to get as lean as possible. After that, you have to step away from that goal and be like, okay, what can I do that will be you know, imperative to improving as an athlete. And I think that you know, all of us can agree that you know, there's always, always room to get better and improve. Um, if you've done a couple of preps and they're just the same thing over and over, you probably either, one, need better like, guidance because we only know what our coaches teach us, right? So all of these habits that we learn, all the you know, disordered habits and way of thinking, we probably had somebody at some point who told us these things. So look at where you're getting your information from. Educate yourself and realize that you, know, you don't know everything and there's always room to improve on that front. Um, and then just, yeah, I guess I think being open to learning more because I think that that's the biggest thing. Um, what I always tell my clients who may be struggling in, in some aspect, um, you know, you have to get real yourself and just kind of ask, is this enhancing my life? It, it really should enhance your life. Um, I know when I started at 18, you know, it was to be a better soccer player, but it made me more confident. Um, it made me fearless in my careers. I've had a lot of different careers that were all, I was a stock trader, I've been a lawyer, and I've always had no problem just to go get it, but that's from my bodybuilding discipline and, and what it's given me and the confidence. And so when I look back over my career, it's always enhanced my life, but I've always been one of those people who, if I'm not in prep and my friends want to stay out till 4 a.m., I stay out till 4 a.m. And I might have had 10 drinks, I don't give a shit. Like, I don't, I don't get so rigid about this lifestyle that I don't embrace the other things of life. So you gotta sit back and say, is it enhancing your life or is it hindering it? Are you afraid to leave the house? Do you have to be in by 10 o'clock because you gotta make your eggs and wet? You know, there's all these things that if it's hindering, it's, it's, it's not potentially for you or you gotta figure out how to hit your, your basic needs to, to do it to, to enhance your life. Um, and that's what I always kinda say, you gotta have a real talk with yourself. Um, and always remember, no progress is linear. It's three steps forward, one back. Um, I've had years where I probably haven't added an ounce of muscle. Um, and, you know, I'm fine with that. And uh, that's just kind of my two cents on, on it. Uh, the one part of your question that I want to answer is, uh, I, I, I'm paraphrasing, you said, how do I know when to step away? It's fucking obvious, man. Step away, right? Like, do you own this thing or does this thing own you? Like, why are you becoming a slave to, no one cares, man. Like, I don't care, I'm not coming back later. Like, you're the only person I think you're, you're just driving yourself insane. Um, so obviously, Chris answers you probably better since he's your actual coach. But I, I agree with the Scooby Prep philosophy. Like, so whole, wholeheartedly. When you're ready for it, do it. If you're not ready for it, step away. No, no one cares. Would you believe that I haven't been on the stage in six years? And no one has held it. No one has held that against me, right? I don't feel any anxiety or reservations about it. So, do it on your time. It took me six years to feel like I want to do this again. And uh, probably going to be eight more years for my next one. <laughs> I love what Jason said about it. Is it making your life better? Um, because. You really, when you look at bodybuilding, it is so funny. You see some people, it just it makes their life better. It makes them stronger, more disciplined. It breaks some people. And so the biggest question is, is it making your life better? And I kind of have to call Ryan out on this one. So I do talk about intensity a lot. And it doesn't mean you're intense all the time. It means you manage your intensity. We've had this conversation before. Ryan and I were talking about last night about how like when he first got back into it, when he came to me, he like forgot how to bodybuild. He's like, he's like, I'm like crazy intense, like for 14 days, and then on the 15th day, like I'm not doing this bodybuilding thing. I'm like gonna gain, I'm gonna gain five pounds. Like it's fine, don't worry about it. And I'm like, no, it's not. So I'm like, 
Um, I, the the um, the I, I, okay. So I have literally um, stopped coaching. Uh, Jason, I think you can attest to this. I think this is really pervasive in NPC and IFBB, where people treat their bodybuilding like a light switch. It's either all on or all off. And I've literally stopped working with some IFBB pros because I'm like, you know, this is not going to work. And um, you, you know, you can't treat your bodybuilding like a light switch. It's just all on or all off. It's it's a dimmer switch. You know, um, it's never all off, and it's rarely all on. I think that you know, as your shows get closer, you turn it up a notch, you turn it up a notch, you just crank the dial up, and then after the show is over, you turn it back down. And you gotta ease into things mentally and how engaged you are, but you just, you need to realize it should rarely be all on. Because, uh, you know, these guys that are all on or all off, usually they're half, half the time it's all on and half the time it's all off. And you do the math on that, you're a 50% guy. Um, you know, I, I take a 90% uh, intensity rate over a 100% over a half the time. So, hope that kind of clears it up. Um, so, Jason and Cliff, you have kind of touched on this a little bit about whether or not it's actually making you better, but I'm curious, Ryan, with respect to your speech too, about hunger getting in the way of your higher hierarchy needs, and it's kind of inherent part of the prep game. So, how do you ensure, what are some of those kind of inner monologues that you have with yourself? How do you ensure that you're still able to actually get to some of those higher order needs during something like a prep? Um, I, I mean, I kind of touched on this. You've heard the talk. I kind of touched on it. I, you kind of use like um, micro mental cal recalibrations. Um, you know, I think during prep, we all have those moments where we kind of start to feel sorry for ourselves a little bit. You know, we're tired and we're hungry. And like you said, it's like all you can think about at times. And you're just like, ah, this is, you know, this sucks. But then I think for myself, I like to use these mental recalibrations where I'm like, wait a minute, you know what? My life is pretty good. I, you know, I'm gonna go to bed tonight. I have another meal coming in two hours. I'm not actually starving to death. Meanwhile, somebody on the other side of the world will literally die tonight from malnutrition. Um, I think pulling, you know, right now when you're hungry, it's like your instinctive um, mindset takes over because instinctively, hunger feels like you might die. It's a signal from your body saying, if you don't eat, you're gonna die. But I think kind of we need to pull it back to our logical mind of, we're not gonna die. It's fine. You know, my life is really good, actually. I can take part in this sport. And then um, I'm big on searching for joys that are not related to food. Um, you know, sometimes when people are like, how do you enjoy Thanksgiving when you can't eat the dinner? I'm like, I'm here with my family and my friends. You know what I mean? Like, find the joys that are not food. Um, for me, that works at least. Yeah, and I think uh, a lot of that higher order stuff, it's, Fascinating to me. Uh, Cliff talked about the kind of higher, lower level brain. So when we uh, get frightened or hungry or something like that, that's like lower level of amygdala type brain. Like when someone, let's say someone jumped in this room and like scared us, right? It would take us about one one hundredth of a second to make that decision. Versus your frontal lobe, which takes one ten, one tenth of a second. So if peanut butter is right in your face, right? Literally, like ten times faster you process the binge decision. It's outpaced the frontal lobe logical decision, right? So that was why one of my points was think, like stop. Just give it a, just give it a second, right? Stop and think. I was talking to Jeremy back to Jeremy in the Green Hoodie. Jeremy is, uh, he's, has a research background, he was in a lab. Every single person I've ever spoken to who comes from a research background, they talk so fucking slow. And like, that's because they're thinking. They're thinking as they're talking. They're just not spewing things out. So I think the second part to this, in order to how do you deal with hunger, and I agree with Cliff fully, like, you're not dying, right? And then you also have a sign to yourself, like, okay, I started this thing with all of my baseline things being fulfilled. So if you're a little hungry, it's not bad if you still get to sit at the birthday party. Oh, so what, I can't eat the cake and all that stuff, but I'm still here, and I have love, and I have a family, and. I don't know, you might have a husband and all that thing. So if you feel totally fulfilled, I think hunger doesn't have as much as a pool. But if you've been in your apartment alone for 10 days, mm, like hunger is everything, right? So that's why I say invest into the other things so the worth of being hungry isn't uh, as exponential. That's how I've done it. 
Have you have you done a prep before? No, I've been to the lifestyle thing so many times. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious because I feel like you guys and people here that are so dedicated to this, the discipline is super admirable, but I just wonder what that internal monologue looks like because I don't experience it. For me, even if it was just like a, a fat loss phase for you or something where you know your hunger is going to be high, um, every time I enter a prep, and I've been doing this for a while, I try to think about kind of where I failed last time in terms of family life, friend life, um, and, and I literally go through my head and say, I'm not gonna do that this time. Like there are times when I train and I have a few friends in the gym and when I'm, when I'm deep into prep, I really don't feel like talking. And I did that last prep, I'm gonna try to be better about that this time. It's like, I, I really in my head, I'm like, God, I hope they don't even come say hi. I just wanna stay on this rep, stay in the set, and just get this done and get out of here. Like, that's just how I felt. But I'm gonna try, I mean, and they know what I'm doing, but I'm gonna try not to do that. So I've already put that in my head. Um, you know, I, I know in the past I don't do this anymore, but if my wife and kids are going to go out to dinner, sometimes I just be like, ah, I don't really want to be around it, I want to go. I go now, and I get a salad, it's plain, and I just eat plain lettuce, but it feels like I'm doing something, I get a Diet Coke, but that's good for the kids, it's good for her, and it, at the end of the day, it's good for me. I'm really not sitting at home focusing on my hunger. Um, so I go through my checklist of what I've done poorly, and like, like I said, when I was first doing this, like the bodybuilding show was so important. Like, so I wouldn't even go, like my friends say, you're about to a bar, nope. Now it's just like I go, like if I miss my meal or something's extended, it's really not the end of the world. Like I'm getting, I'm gonna have my pro day meal and I'm working on it right now. And like a few of my macros were a little off this weekend, not bad, but just, I'm just like, I got 12 weeks, it's fine. Like, so you gotta go in through your head and start thinking about where you kind of felt in the past. Um, I will say for me, hunger is not really the thing, it's the energy level. And so my wife and I kind of have this understanding. Until I'm about four weeks out, I'd better be pretty damn normal and not an asshole. And so I have to live up to that standard. When I'm four weeks out, she kind of knows, all right, I'm gonna let you just get through this month. We always wanna be done. Uh, but up until then, if I'm being a jerk, that's on me, really. Uh, so it's more about the energy levels than the hunger for, for me. I don't mind hunger. I really don't. I'm hungry right now. I really don't bother. I feel great. Right yeah, yeah, I feel great. <laughs> it's, it's, when I get so, yeah, it's when I get so lean that my body just doesn't want to move, that I have to really start talking to myself, like, all right, just go to dinner with them. Because I'm just, I'm low energy, not really the hunger. Um, so try to embrace hunger a little bit, as like, I think, was it Billy Man in Cayman? Someone said, like, it's what your body's supposed to be doing because you're trying to lose fat, so kind of embrace it as it's a benefit, and it's a positive, not a negative. Like that. Does anyone else want to continue? Yeah, just one more thing to add. Um, so what Cliff was saying, and Ryan too, I completely agree, um, it's called, cognitive restructuring. So basically doing intentional interventions to change the way that you think about something. That can be applied to many different topics when it comes to hunger, just changing your viewpoint on hunger. Um, another thing to note is you are not going to be able to do this when you're in a fat loss phase, right? Because you're not subjective and it's something that you're, you're, you're hungry, right? So a good thing to add to your goal checklist in your off season is how can I change the way that I think about hunger? Um, how can I make better habits? How can I, what Ryan was saying, be more mindful and in the present? You know, I mean, for the most part, I mean, I still, you know, track macros sometimes in the off season, but more so I focus on being more mindful about how I'm eating, um, like my hunger signals. Am I actually really hungry? Is it something that, you know, I just think I'm hungry? Um, it's like easier to do that in the off season. Like, do I have to, like whenever I go out to eat, do I have to order the most gluttonous thing on the menu? Or can I just order a salad and be content with that? And for the most part, these are all things that we can get better about in the off season that'll help, you know, you know, diminish that big, you know, switch between off season and contest prep. So just be more mindful and just really thinking, um, you know, like I said, hunger. It's not inherently a bad thing when you're dieting, you're supposed to be hungry. Yeah. Uh, so one thing that's unique about this sport is that, man, I could say that everyone here, maybe, except, well, I guess I could say you, but like, the more you do this, like the more your body hurts, right? Like, you know, you've been doing something with it for a while, it's like, this hurts, that hurts, this hurts. And like, that in itself is integrity, kind of like weakens and you have to work around that stuff. But, like the mental stuff, the longer you do it, like it should, if you treat it right, it should be the other way around. And like with time, you're going to get stronger, you're going to get better at like gutting through things. Um, and on that note, like this is what you said, it's like think about like when you're hitting a 10 rep set and you're like in those last two reps, 
like and like to the average person, like the Planet Fitness person, they look at you and they're like, that looks miserable. Right. Like, yeah. whoa. But like you're after that and you enjoy it. And it's kind of the same thing with hunger and when it talks. It's like, think of it, like you need to frame it in that same way. Like, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm tapping into stored fuel and it's, it's not what my body wants to use. I'd much rather not use stored body fat, but that's what it feels like. And this is my goal. So, uh, framing it in that way. And like with time, the longer you do it, the easier it gets. So, this, this is something Ryan and I were talking about, like how you're, it's perfect to go with what he said, where your mental toughness just increases over time. So um, in 2016, um, when I won my pro card, um, I, who, does anybody hear like nuts and more? Nuts and more, the peanut butter, you know, it's like, it tastes like candy to me, you know, but it has protein in it, all right? So it has like a protein, slight protein taste, but I love it. Um, so I was eating it and I let my dad, my dad, I told my dad I love this stuff. My dad doesn't bodybuild or work out or anything and he's like, uh, he tried it and he goes, he goes, oh, I don't, I don't like that at all. I'm like, oh, I love this stuff. It's so good, you know? So maybe, maybe me 10 years ago wouldn't have enjoyed it, but then my stepmom tried it and she goes, oh God, that's awful. So I go to my show and I, I win and I come back with my trophies and my stepmom's sister, who really just doesn't work out. She's never done anything fitness. And she goes, uh, she, you know, she's asking me questions about my diet and stuff like that. And, and you know, I go to bed and I wake up in the morning and she sits down and she goes, you know, I didn't fully understand what you put yourself through to get to this level until I tried this stuff that you have right here. She goes, the fact that you make yourself eat this stuff is incredible to me. That's all you have to think. And I'm like, this is the stuff, this is the highlight of my day. <laughs> and, and so, um, you know, I think like, you know, to somebody who has never done it before, that making themselves eat something that has this protein taste to it is like, yeah, it's so far away from where I am, where that's the joy of my day. So you do it long enough, like your capacity to do these things just changes and builds. So I'm assuming most of you have had at least some kind of chronic injury that you've gone through. And I'm wondering what what mental strategies or like what pushed you through actually doing the right things to recover instead of focusing on that short term gratification. Well, kind of going off her thing, there was this one time in 2008, I thought like bodybuilding was like over. Like, um, I had, uh, and so to this day, like I have to work around this injury. But at that point, like I couldn't move my leg. It was like wiggling. I'm like, I'm done. That's it. Uh, I've worked so hard, but I guess this, this is it. Today's like, was the last day. Um, and I remember thinking in my head, like just scanning through things that, that I do well. And I had come up with a list that night of things that I was going to do now. And how like, I, like same like mindset, like, it's like I hope this person doesn't do it because I'm about to like crush them. Like this is gonna be my new thing. Um, so I guess like the worst case, like to me is always like, I can take these qualities and apply them somewhere else that like at some point my body just says like no, or like whether it be mentally or physically. So um, when I look at the worst case, it's like I can take certain segments of me, transplant them somewhere else, be just fine and I'll be happy because I never expected this to give me this much happiness. I never saw myself like still to this day like lifting weights as excited as I was when I was 16. So um, I guess like that's, I, I, I go there often. It's like worst case, I don't know, I'll do like pottery and like be like fucking great at it. So. <laughs> so I think uh, at least the three of us, we've all had a powerlifting injury which I know you're familiar with, and man, you bodybuilders think you get injured. <laughs> Those powerlifting injuries, man. So I um, think that any injury I've dealt with over the long term, I've had to remember, like, okay, uh, every sport has an injury reserve list, right? Every sport has an injury. Every professional sport, football player, football, they all have an injury list, right? And it's just that we don't have that list in our organizations, so you feel almost isolated in your injury because there isn't a collective 
where you can go do group PT with, or you can go sit in the ice bath with, with other injured athletes of your kind. So I think one, um, and we see a lot of this, uh, having a really support group, right? Having someone else who's been through it, having other people who are going through developing an injury. Uh, two, identity. It's why I, Liliana talked about it, I talked about it. If I lose, Every, if I can walk again after the next 10 seconds, if I can never walk again, I got my base, man. I got everything I need. Like, take the top thing from me, right? But I never gave too much of my value and too much of myself in that top thing. And I think also, like, do what you can, right? Like, you can't look at where you were. Like, I wish I could eat how I was when I was 15, right? But that's gone forever. Um, and I think things come and go and kind of knowing that everything is finite and enjoying if all you if anyone in here is healthy, ride it out. Because when it's done, it is it's a it's a it's a wrap. And this is a sport, so it's probably gonna be over well before half of your life is is, is over. So um, I think dealing with the identity of who you are as a person and saying this is something I do has helped me with injuries at least. So um, I didn't have a direct injury, but um, I know the medical community doesn't recognize adrenal fatigue, but I had it in 2015, and um, I had to take the whole year off from like hard training. I can only train like three days a week. Um, I, I couldn't only hit cardio, um, you know, and while I was doing that, I was supposed to be eating more. So I got a little soft, got a little smaller, but I'm just more of a fixer. I don't really sit and overanalyze shit, and like that's what I had to do to fix it. So I really didn't sit and dwell on, oh, oh, woe is me. I knew that if I did the right shit, I'd be fixed. Um, so I think it's more of just kind of thinking short term instead of long term. And oh my gosh, you know, this is the end of the world. Just get to fixing it, whatever it is. I mean, do your rehab, eat right. If they tell you to stay off of it, stay off of it. And the thing is, I mean, sometimes you need that rest. I swear, like, and then the next year in 2016, I slowly picked up my training, still wasn't going super hard, but my body was really well rested. And when I hit that prep, I only had seven weeks to get ready for junior nats last year when I was trying to get my, or 2016, when I was trying to get my pro card, my body's never responded faster in its life. Um, and I swear it was from all that rest. Um, so sometimes, I mean, if you just look at it the right way, I just don't really, I don't remember being like super bummed about it. I just remember being this, I gotta fix this, but I was really proactive, like, I hired the right guy to do it, I learned, I read, and now it's the point where actually I can help my clients who get it. So it, all, it ended up being all a benefit to me. Um, but yeah, I think it's just the story you, you tell yourself and, and how you sell it. I know like my wife and I go round and round, but you know sometimes she'll tell me something that she wants me to sympathize with her and I just get to the point of fixing it. It's like, all right, we do this, we do that. She's like, can't you just give me a hug and say, I'm sorry that's happening. But that's not me, I just, I look to fix things. So, um, you know, I think it's just about how you how you view it in, in the grand scheme of things. On to, to be honest with you, hey, hey Cliff. So over here, Cliff Wilson. Over here, there. I know you call me all the time. <laughs> Will you add something to that though? Because I think this is key for you to add. Because a lot of people sometimes they have to take a week or two or three weeks off. Your slideshow that everyone just saw saw all that progression, and right there in the middle of that, somewhere you ended up getting sick for like six to eight weeks. Yeah. We talked about it, but you didn't even fucking work out once. And I know people freak out about muscle loss and all that. And as the person with the shittiest genetics in the room, you just showed <laughs> what you were able to do. Seriously, uh, you, you need to probably talk about that. Yeah, uh, like 2014. I don't know what it was. I got I got sick, and I just couldn't shake it. It wasn't bad. I just it was like sore throat, sneezing, coughing. I was sick for like eight weeks. I went to the doctor a couple times. I was like, I don't really know what's wrong, you know? And um, I just couldn't train. And I tried to go back to training a couple times and it just made me feel worse. And it was like, it was like eight weeks I didn't train. And um, you know, eight weeks, two months without training just feels like an eternity. And now I look back on it and I'm like, that was like not a blip on the radar. You know what I mean? Like it's just, you need to like put things in perspective, the grand scheme of things. And like you said, you weren't training that much. Muscle memory is such, I've written an article on it, from, you know, before I had a client one time, he was hospitalized uh, due to some di uh, digestive disease and he lost 34 pounds of muscle. Like just, yeah, lost everything. 
Um, and then when he was healthy, we were like, we're going for it. And he put back on the 34 pounds of muscle in three months. Like, it, it's, muscle memory is such a powerful thing. So when you have an injury, like remind yourself, one, in like five years, you're barely gonna remember this. And also, once you're healthy again, it's gonna come back so fast. Like, you're, you know, you just need to perspective, perspective, perspective. Can I have one more thing on injuries? Okay. And just one more thing on injuries. Um, and I might be biased because this is what I want to do as a career, but there are sports psychologists who specialize in these things, okay? Um, I think the biggest thing that people struggle with with injury is not the physical. You know, we have we have access to, you know, medical practitioners. We have access to personal um, or physical therapists. Um, but when it comes to coping, most athletes don't know how to deal with it. So I think um, having a plan when you're trying to get better is just as important. So think about how dedicated you are to your training or your, or your nutrition when you're healthy. You know, you go into the gym with a plan. The same thing should be done when you have low motivation because you have a loss of identity because you became injured. That's the hardest part is being motivated enough to actually do your rehab and adhere to it um, with just as much passion and vigor as you would if you were a healthy athlete. So having a plan, um, you know, there's so much research out there that shows the effects on imagery and healing, um, having a social support network, um, all of these things which can help you just, you know, heal physically and mentally. So we've got time for a couple more questions. So if you need to ask, all right, we're here, I'll give it to you guys in a second. Okay, this one's for Cliff, or it can be for whoever. Um, it's a rapid back question, so I figured that would be appropriate. Yeah. Um, so typically we hear water, you know, water stays in, stays high. Talk about sodium, sodium normally is elevated. Don't hear a lot of talk about potassium though, and where that really falls in the ratio. So we'll just make it simplify it. Last day before the show, they're rapid back load, loaded 1,000 grams of carbs for 24 hours, 36 hours. Where does potassium fall in that ratio of sodium and water in that equation? Gotcha, so um, what I do with potassium, we're in a rapid back load, is a little bit different with what I do with potassium in just a, any other peaking scenario. Um, I, I honestly, like, I kind of observe, like I ask people as peak peak is close, like what kind of foods have you been having? And you know, it, it gives me an idea where their baseline potassium lies. Um, I find that like, in general, a lot of people with a normal peaking strategy will look their best with maybe like a um, uh, five to one, between five to one and five to 2.5 ratio of sodium to potassium. Um, so, you know, somewhere along those, uh, around, the, around those baseline levels. But with rapid backload, I do it a little bit different. I bring sodium down during the, or sorry, potassium down during the deplete portion. Um, because you can kind of actually uh, further your glycogen deplete by reducing potassium a little bit. And then at the beginning phase of the rapid back load, I bring potassium really high um, because it will kind of fill, fill up the potassium levels and then I taper down as the day goes. So, I mean, this is something along the lines of, like, I'm not using potassium supplements, it's just like, I just changed the food source. So I start the load with something like sweet potatoes or white potatoes. And then I taper and I'll use something like uh, lower potassium or moderate potassium, like Cheerios, because Cheerios, you know, anybody who's ever like seen my clients posting things like potatoes and then Cheerios, the reason is because of the nutrients in there. So then like um, uh, Cheerios would be, it has potassium, but it's, it's a moderate amount. And then by the end of the day, I'm going low potassium with something like rice cakes. Um, so I kind of taper, you know, start high and then taper low. Um, it's, it's just something I've observed. Um, as you get closer to stage time, I like to kind of like load the electrolytes, sodium and potassium, and then as stage gets closer, I kind of like to stay away from the electrolytes a little bit because I find people just get a little bit blurry. I'll hit people with sodium right before stage, but if you um, just keep pumping them full of electrolytes, they're just gonna look a little blurry in my experience. Okay, and this is to Cliff. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm starting to get back into this after several years. Hell, we were on stage together man, five years ago. Um, anyway, my question is kind of with uh, prep, and you know, you're for over the years you've posted pretty controversial things on Facebook, and I love it. I love it. It's just like I read everything, and you know, you give your claim, and people come back and like, oh, that's bullshit. And you're like, well, this is why. And you give yourself a reason. Um, 
you know, a couple of things I've uh, been in my mind for the last couple of years is uh, uh, prep week with uh, water consumption and sodium. And I've, you know, I've read posts in the past of you talking kind of about how you debunk the, the you know, just certain uh, coaches kind of like basically cut off their clients' water altogether and they get that, like, you have to do that. They're like, hell no, you have to give them several gallons of water have to up their sodium. And I was kind of wanting to have you talk about kind of like how much you give clients, I guess, kind of like with gallons getting into their prep week show and like sodium levels and I guess your reasoning behind that, the science behind that. I mean, as far as water goes, I think water's really the easiest. I mean, you know, we all coach up here. I think a lot of times I find that just establishing a baseline water intake that is high enough and then just keep it there. Um, because, you know, it's, it's assuming carbohydrates are where they should be, you know, water will follow solutes. Water's going to follow glucose, water's going to follow sodium, water's going to follow potassium. So as long as um, you are carved up appropriately and sodium and potassium levels are at the appropriate levels, you drink enough water, the excess is just going to be urinated out. It's just, you know, it's just the way the body works. Um, but if you uh, drink enough water and you overcarb, the water is going to follow those carbohydrates to the subcutaneous areas, to the interstitial fluid. Um, so with water, I mean, it's pretty simple, you know, for women, I may go, uh, you know, 1.25 to two gallons for men. I may go somewhere between one and a half to two and a half gallons. And I just leave it pretty static. Um, sodium, you know, I think you guys can attest this. sodium is very individual. Uh, and you know, it's the same reason, <laughs> uh, for, for those of you that know my client, Katie Ann, um, she spoke to me at one point, I was like, you know, we were about seven weeks out. I'm like, how much sodium do you get per day? And she's like, I get about 18,000 milligrams. And I'm like, you mean, you mean 1,800 milligrams? She's like, no, like 18,000. I'm like, what? How is this even possible? Um, I brought her down upon hearing this, but I mean, throughout her peak week, she won WNBF Figure Worlds, and her sodium was around 6,000 to 7,000 milligrams through the entire week. Whereas a lot of people, that would just... I mean, they would blow horribly. Um, so I think it's, uh, if you have a coach, the coach should maybe do it. If it's you, I, I honestly think you need to play around with your sodium looks before peak week comes and find where you look good. Um, everybody has this kind of sweet spot where their, where their um, body lies. And, and I'll kind of, you know, I tinker with it where I may bring some people up and I may bring some people down. Because some people look better with their, we were talking, Berto and I and myself were talking yesterday about different people have different load looks. Like when I'm carbohydrate loading somebody, like myself and Virgo have a tight load look. If carbohydrates are actively coming up, um, even if we spill a little bit, we look tight everywhere. Whereas like someone like Ryan, he has like a blurry load look. So like he needs to load and then back away and let things clear up. I kind of find the same thing with sodium. Some people, you give them a lot of sodium, they get very tight and full. Um, other people, you give them a lot of sodium, they look blurry. So I think you know, finding your low look with sodium is pretty um, important for individuality. And as far as water, keep it, keep it steady, keep it static, and you'll be fine. The only, the only, I just would add one thing. Uh, the only thing I would add to start seeing how you affect or are affected by sodium, I watch how my clients respond to cheat meals. You ever see those people who go have a cheat meal, they're up eight pounds? Well, I can have the same cheat meal, I'd be up maybe a half a pound if I'm lucky. And I can, I can go do that with sushi, and I can douse the shit out of it with some soy sauce. <laughs> so I use a lot of sodium in my peak week, um, and I do a lot of high-carb loading, too, closer to the show. So that will at least give you an idea, if you're working with a client, to where they might be on their sodium. I'm not saying it's full group, but at least starts the discussion, for, for me anyways. Was there, yeah, just a cool This is kind of using powerlifting as an example. So a good powerlifter, like they kind of know what they're projected to lift on that day. Like they're not gonna try anything that based on their training, like you know, isn't within their capability. So for a physique athlete, like, you should be taking notes, especially as you get closer, because you're gonna find some trends that they're very unique to you, but you see them over and over and, and they've been consistent and that's more so what you want to aim for. So even you know, like Cliff with his rapid back load, he'll, uh, thank you, he'll, you, you give guys some trial runs a few weeks before, remember like Kong Wolf, like he, he, he played with it and, and they kind of knew what was around the corner every time. So um, yeah, I think once you are close enough to where your, your physiology is gonna mimic what you're going to see on show day, 
um, start start taking notes, and that way, like a lot less things are like just kind of help, right? All right, uh, this question is probably for Pray and you out there. Uh, uh, before prep, before uh, the diet, or anything, right? You can walk around, and, and nobody may notice you, right? So you know, doing prep, you know, you get a little leaner, get a little bit more attention. How, how do you deal with the higher level of expectations and responsibility that comes with what you're doing, you know, for yourself, but everybody else, you know, coming to you with questions and you know, uh, people that want to inspire to do what you do. Uh, how do you deal with that when you really just kind of focus on what you're doing and, and you know, those responsibilities just kind of, kind of, kind of just thrown at you? I think I was at USAPO Nationals with Ryan and like some young lady walks up to us and she's like, holy crap, both of you are here. And like Ryan said the most appropriate thing and that was like, we're so bad at so many things. Like, you just don't, you don't see that. You're just good at this. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's like, I'm so bad at so many things. So it's like very hard to get carried away with it. Um, I'm so useless when it comes to so many other things and I rely on so many other people. Like, I, I, I rely on her for so many things because she's better at a collection of stuff that I just, I'd rather not even publicly do. So when it comes to like the, the respect and, and, and the admiration that people give me for this, it's like, it's like yeah, that's, that's, that's cool, thank you. Um, but it's hard to take it too serious. Um, like I've always, to me it's always been like, I don't want to, I'm like, I'm glad that I'm, I'm pretty good at this, but I'm not so good that I'm just like, like I'm like Phil Heath, like that dude, it's like he's, he's unaware of everything because he's that good, he, he's never had to be good at anything else because he's that good. Whereas with me, it's, it's like, I just, I want to leave things better than how I found them and, and do the, and I guess like that in some way takes a uh, place in what I do with my athletes and, and my people and, that hopefully I'm affecting like like without even like going in a positive way. So it's hard to get on the high horse about any of this, to be honest. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll leave it to one of these guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think one thing I've noticed, especially since being in the industry, is that so many people want to be popular for the sake of being popular. Um, to have the following, to have people, you know, talk about their physique, to talk about how wonderful they are. And I will say, going through a contest prep, like, you're going to get that. You're going to get a lot of positive affirmation. You're going to get a lot of people coming to you because you look the part now, asking you, um, you know, what did you do to do this? Um, and I think that, you know, the more I'm in this industry, the more I realize, like, I want this for my own like moral obligations, like I want to contribute something positive. Like I don't, like there's no point in having a huge following if you're not doing something beneficial that can help other people about it. You know, there's so many times where I've thought over the past four years, like I just need to do a prep so I can just gain more followers so I can like make a bigger impact. Because people notice you more when you post those selfies and you post pictures of your physique. And the more you do that, the more you think like, okay, that's what people expect of me. This is my only way to contribute is by showing off my physique. Whereas, you know, once you realize like that's, you know, not um, what you're actually looking for, you can, you know, be the most shredded person on this world and you have all these people thinking highly of you, but it's not self-fulfilling. You're not really doing anything, um, you know, that's fulfilling in any ways. You're more likely to, realize like okay i want to make a positive like contribution to this industry how can i do that and by doing that you you know put more content out there for free give out like more valuable resources so people see your value it's not only going to help you maybe if you're a coach um you know people are actually going to trust you they're going to you know find you very knowledgeable and useful beyond your physique the more willing to buy your product, so that's you know a beneficial thing. But more so, you're just gonna have so much more fulfillment and enjoyment, enjoyment throughout this entire process. Um, I guess you know, in my mind, I've always tried to just not take it too seriously, and I, I'm still just a struggling bodybuilder like everyone else. I mean, you know, I, it, it's one of those things where when someone asks me a question, I always want to give them the best answer I can. You know. Um, and I certainly 
love to just help people and, and give them the right answer the best I can. So I don't know that I've ever, hopefully I've never shied away from that. That's the way I've always done it. Um, I've seen some coaches online who, once they started to get a little notoriety and things, they would they would post things like, well, if you want to know the, you know, the rest of this answer, you can hire me. Or that's what I give to my clients, so I can't tell you. And I've never taken that stance. Like if people DM me or whatever, I always try to answer, you know, and, and things of that nature. So I've always just tried to kind of put out, you know, that kind of vibe where, yeah, I'll help and, and, you know, give you the answer. So, you know, I've met people at the gym and things that ended up becoming friends of mine for years, you know, and just kind of meeting people that way. And they're just curious about your craft and stuff, and you just start talking. You know, the one thing it does, you know, bring up is that when, when you are in prep, you do have to kind of remember the people that, you know, I can ignore my friends, but like when it's kind of other strangers, I still even try to talk to them, even if I'm training, because I don't want to give that first impression I'm an asshole, you know? So, um, and that can be hard when you're like really tired, but that, that you do need to kind of keep in mind, like they're curious about what you're doing, so just, you know, it's okay, it's, it's only gonna be a minute, it's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, I think giving out free content and things like that as a coach, or if you're ever, you know, aspiring to do something like that, free content, doing those things and answering people's questions is really what you should be should be doing and not be shying away from it at all. So I kind of welcome it, I guess is what I'm, is what I'm saying. Yeah, so I agree with all the answers so far, but the theme seems to be uh, humility, like staying humble in all of this, and I think uh, staying humble is not like something you should try to do, um, but like my talk today, like a lot of you came up to me and said you enjoyed it, that was like an hour of me talking to myself, like I'm not joking, like I'm just talking to myself, I wasn't really doing it for anybody, and I realized that popularity is almost a manifestation of that self, right? So it's like I've been obsessively trying to just be good at Ryan and people have watched, right? And it's like I look up and I'm like, holy shit, you're watching me, right? So I think for me, uh, even now in this prep or anything I do or anything work related, I'm, I'm not doing this for anybody. Like I am just obsessed with player one. Like I'm just so crazily trying to get good at this thing that other people notice, right? And I think uh, it becomes a game of people watching other people. Like, I have no idea what's going on outside of me, right? I mean, enough to be aware, but uh, I think that natural humbleness and humility comes because I know how much I suck. Like, I know how much more I have to go. Like, I'm just trying to get to the goal. Like, I'm just trying to be, be the best right I can. So, yeah, I, I think, as I said, right, sharing content, the reason why I share content is because it's like, oh, shit, I I drove, my, I drove myself crazy for six months. Maybe I can help somebody else out, right? Because I know what I went through trying to figure this thing out. So um, I think pressure, there's really none. You just, like, people don't know what they're talking about. Like people say things and I'm like, you have, you have, you have, you don't even know me. Like you don't, you don't know what you're talking about. So I think it comes focusing on yourself and people say things because it's because of the parasocial one relationship. They watch you grow but I've just watched me, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah, I think that's my best answer. All right, so I, I actually love, I think that's a, like a sneaky good question um, because there are, there's so many avenues you can go with that. So there is actually some research behind um, showing like uh, goal setting and they say that like one of the uh, biggest hindrances to people achieving their goals is telling people their goals. If you tell people your goals, you are less likely to achieve them. Uh, the reason behind that is when you tell people your goals, they say, hell yeah, good job, go get it. And it makes you feel accomplished even though you haven't done shit yet. Um, and it's like, it's proven. Like if you want to accomplish your goals, keep that to yourself. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons like, I don't even like to talk about what show I'm doing. I don't usually pick a show so that people can't be like, oh my God, the date's coming up, you're gonna get it. It makes you feel accomplished even though you haven't done anything yet. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think that it's kind of important to keep that in mind, you know what I mean? Like when people are telling you how awesome you look and how great you're gonna be, um, remember that, you know what I mean? Like remember, don't let that make you feel accomplished because you haven't done anything yet. And um, so I think that is like uh, the first factor you need to look at. And the second thing I tell my clients, so I even made this mistake as a coach early on uh, in my career. You know, client would send me a progress picture at six week out, six weeks out, I'd be like, God, they look so damn good. I'm gonna put this on my Facebook page. And I didn't realize I was contributing to their expectation. Um, and I found that some people it was just hard for them to live up to it, you know what I mean? Now I only post pictures before people's shows if I like one thousand percent sure this person is like 
ready. You know, they've done this before. They're okay with this. Um, I rarely do it because it makes them feel um, burdened with expectation. It, um, it can make them feel accomplished even though they haven't done anything yet. So I need to wear that as a coach. And so um, now what I really tell my clients, and then some of the expectation comes from yourself. I know what you all do, because I've done it before. You know, you, you, you lay in bed at night and you imagine what it's gonna feel like on stage. What's gonna be like when they hand you that first place trophy. You know what I mean? You envision, you get excited, you're in the gym when you, when you uh, start seeing new things pop out. And you're like, I'm just gonna go in there and rip it up. I tell my clients, I'm gonna sound like the most, uh, like Buzz Killington here. I'm gonna tell you, like, I tell my clients, don't get so excited. Like, you feel yourself getting excited, kind of like temper that a little bit because um, every emotion kind of comes with um, a down, a down slope. Excitement, like over excitement, is usually followed by like a crash that comes after. Um, how many times? Okay, your excitement for your show. How many times do you feel like crap post show because you exert, you um, uh, exhausted so much energy over being excited? Um, if you're like 20 weeks out and people are telling you how good you look and how awesome you're gonna do, like, don't get excited about that. Like, you know, you may feel it coming on and just be like, no, don't think about your show either. Like, I told my clients to focus on the next, you know, focus on the next. Because getting excited about your show does nothing to help you look better for your show. You know what helps you get better for your show? Eating your next meal, having your next good training session, getting your next good night's sleep. Like, focus on those things that make you better. Um, while it feels good to get excited, usually there's a down, a, a down after side to it. So, um, you know, just kind of, you know, put the blinders on, focus on the next. Yeah, and one, one final thing to add too as we wrap up, since we're talking about interaction, Jason, you talked about, we have so many coaches in here, 95% of the room are coaches. When you are interacting with people, one thing I heard Andy Priscilla say that's always stuck with me, Keep it in the back of your head. If that person that you're interacting with is gonna write a review of you on social media, what would you want that review to say? So when you're responding to DMs and messages and you're tired, or you're talking to people here at the Physique Summit, you've been up for two days on low sleep, you're gonna brush them off or you're gonna take the time to actually think, this person thinks enough of me to send me questions, to, to sit here and wanna pick my brain. So think about that whenever you're interacting with people. So with that being said, go ahead and give our panel a round of applause. A couple, couple things before we, we dismiss. We do want to recognize the farthest traveler, and I'm just gonna start calling you Alaska. So Alaska, <laughs> please stand up. You have free tickets next year to the Physique Summit. <laughs> and finally, guys, we will be sending out an email with all the PowerPoint presentations here in the next day or two, give me some time. And we want to, and I'm, we're gonna ask you, we know this is a good event, but what can we do better? What are the one, two, three, four things that you didn't like, or what do you think can be done better? And that's what we take every year. And suggestions on the panel. That's how you make something better. We know it's good, like this is a great, you can feel it in here, okay? But we wanna know what we can do better and help us spread the word. Guys, be safe, do you have anything that you wanna say? Yeah, just like he said, um, we really appreciate you guys, the speakers, thank you guys so much. Um, you know, this is, uh, we've kind of grown this organically, and we just ask, you know, if you did have a good time here, help us spread the word, because, um, you know, we grow the numbers for this event by people spreading the word every year. Uh, uh, you know, our vision for this is to one day, you know, have 300, 400 people here, um, because I think that an event like this makes the industry better. And so, um, you know, if you had a good time, please help us spread the word next year when the time comes. We would really appreciate that. Thank you guys. Yeah, we love you guys. Be safe. We'll see you next year.